Our next presentation uh, topic is uh, damage study and future directions for structural design following the Tuscaloosa tornado of 2011. Dr. John Vandalin, PhD, uh, is professor chair of, civil, of the civil engineering department at the University of Alabama. So join me in welcoming Dr. Vandalin. Like you've, you've heard in the last few presentations, I, I think uh, just a fantastic summary, so I just want to offer my, my thanks to the speakers. I've learned a lot already today. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about a study that we did following the, the tornado in Tuscaloosa. This occurred actually about the, uh, the last day of April uh, into the first few days of May. It was about a week-long study. The project team was Dave Pravat, uh, Andy Grettinger. Uh, I don't know if Andy's out there. I don't think so. I'll show some of his uh, graduate students' handiwork uh, during the presentation. Of course, myself, Rakesh Gupta from Oregon State, uh, Bill Colburn from ATC, who was responsible for much of ATC 45 that you just heard uh, uh, spoken about, Sam Henson, which, who's out there somewhere that you heard from uh, a few hours ago, uh, and then a former PhD student of mine, uh, Shilang Pei, up at South Dakota State, as well as a number of students from a few different universities. So I know I feel a little guilty. I grabbed this off of Wikipedia, uh, not because I'm, I'm lazy, but because I wanted a general definition of, of kind of what the public and professionals think a structural engineer is. And what I noted is that uh, it says, must ensure their design satisfy given design criteria predicated on safety. And then it says, e.g., structures must not collapse without due warning. And then I just moved on. <laughs> and so then I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to, you know, with, with the, the risk of being presumptuous, I'll, I'll define it myself. And so, uh, so what I came up with was, was structural, and I do teach a structural reliability class. Some of those students are here today. Uh, structural engineering is a specialty within civil engineering in which engineers design buildings and other generally large structures, not always, but to resist combinations of loads, including natural hazards loading. The design loads are selected through a combination of statistics and experience such that structures have a probability of failure acceptable to the stakeholders. And so one of the big questions that we'll examine today, I hope, uh, is what is acceptable. You've heard a lot today from several speakers about the enhanced Fujita scale. Um, I, I learned uh, early on when I was very young about uh, the F scale. Natural hazards always interested me, and then uh, when the enhanced Fujita scale came out, uh, we, we did apply it uh, as a group, an engineering group that uh, here in Tuscaloosa that you heard about. And uh, to give you an example, if you take a look at, I think this is a, uh, is this a laser pointer, I hope? There we go. I don't know if you'll even see that back there, but. <laughs> Um, so if you look here, this, this actually, uh, say we have here, this would, this would be somewhere between exterior walls collapsed and most walls collapsed. And so you could, you could actually say, you could say, well, that's somewhere between 113 and 178 miles an hour. Now, that's, that's a big range. And so if we go back to the EF scale rating, we could give that anywhere between an EF to 2 to an EF 4. And so you can see it's, it's very subjective. And so uh, like John DeBlock said this morning, it's, it's, it's really uh, you know, very interesting that two groups with very different training but, but similar interests uh, are able to kind of um, independently validate or, or semi-independently validate uh, each, other's, each other's work. And so, um, and so we went through, and uh, uh, first I want to show this just to, I think you saw a lot of this this morning, just to show this was about the time, obviously, this is hitting. And then as Sam mentioned, I'll try not to, to reiterate too much of, of his as well, um, we made 12 transects uh, perpendicular, approximately perpendicular to the path of the tornado. You know, obviously the, uh, uh, the streets within the city of Tuscaloosa um, did not all run perp perfectly perpendicular to the uh, tornado as we found out the hard way, uh, uh, working our way through streets. and, and um, a few groups actually wound up going parallel to the tornado, which didn't help too much, but uh, we were able to gather quite a bit. We gathered uh, hundreds of very detailed investigations and uh, did the, the forensics on them. And so um, in going through, just to give you kind of a recap of what we saw, and I think you've seen a lot of this, but I think from, a, from an EF scale rating, I'll show you how, how, how we, you know, what, this is how we rated these photos. I'll just show you the, a few of these. So a threshold of visible damage, we begin to see damage between 53 and 80 miles per hour. 
loss of roof covering then occurs at 81 to 116. And you can see these are fairly, fairly broad with that, that expected damage being right, right in the median or what we, the, the middle of that. The loss of the roof system at 104 to 142. Then loss of exterior walls, 113 to 153. Most walls collapsed, 127 to 178. And this can even be, you know, we can range, depends, uh, can be down even a little lower. Now this one, this is all walls collapsed. And th this is interesting. You've heard a few stories today while I was, I was talking to a, a woman that, um, that that blanket that you see there, she was actually laying on that grate uh, with the blanket over her with her, her uh, live-in boyfriend when the, uh, uh, about a middle-aged middle -aged woman, and she said that they, they actually uh, received the warning from the weather service, and they went outside to see if they could see the tornado, and they thought, and, and basically uh, the, the gentleman said, he, he, he told her that, well, we'll hear it coming because it'll sound like a freight train. And the minute we hear that, we should have about two minutes. And she said they, when they heard it, she said they had about two or three seconds to, to and they, so they, they, had a, they actually had a shelter in back, so they ran to the shelter and uh, couldn't get in the shelter. And this is, this is another view of that house. And this is the, the house next door, just to give you an idea of wind speed. Uh, and this is what their shelter looked like when they opened it. Uh, it was a, I don't know if it was a bomb shelter. This was around uh, post-World War II or maybe even a little before. Um, and this was full of water, uh, all sorts of things. In fact, they said they opened it and their, they had two dogs and they said their dogs turned around and wouldn't get in it, even with the tornado coming. So, <laughs> and so, so they wound up, uh, um, so they wound up huddling underneath there and she had a broken arm uh, and, and he, uh, he had a uh, broken foot, but they had survived. Now, this is the Chastain Manor uh, uh, apartments uh, that you heard so much about, and I think, I think Sam, as well as, as John, show, showed a, a photo of this. And, and this is the one, originally we rated this an EF5 uh, as, as a team, and that was with Bill Colburn, who, who developed most of ATC 45. Um, and we, we discussed it at length. We spent probably at the meeting, we had about, a, um, about an eight-hour meeting to do EF ratings, and we spent about an hour and a half on this one. Uh, we had about 100 photos of the apartment. And we, we were split, uh, so an EF four and a half is probably a, a reasonable uh, uh, estimate. But uh, truth be told, um, the estimate of 190 is, is quite reasonable. I think being able to estimate between 190 and 200 is impossible from damage. I think you can only estimate between 190 and 200 if you have a wind gauge that can go that high. And just a few photos to show you that. And this, I hiked up to the top of the hill to get this photo, and you can see um, down on the bottom left, this is, this is where that slab is swiped clean. And so, of course, the tornado, tornado I don't know if you, uh, barreled down through here. Uh, and so it was, of course, rotating like this. And, um, you know, our feeling initially was just the topography might have had something to do with it. I, you know, I talked more with John at lunch, and... And, and, you know, I, I don't see how it really could other than, you know, because the tornado is, is so large and so it goes so high into the atmosphere. But, um, you know, so my, my guess is that what we saw there is, is just an EF4 and, and basically that, that front side took the brunt on the, the high wind side speed uh, with the tornado going 50, 60 miles or the storm moving 50, 60 miles an hour. And then there's a good example. You can see the slab a little bit better. Uh, and then just a couple of photos to, and this is Forest Lake, obviously. You know, one thing to, to note from uh, the standpoint of, of uh, you know, as a, as a resident, uh, even if the walls stay up, and I, I saw this, I see this, I've been to, uh, I've been to hurricanes, I've been to floods, um, I've been to, earthquakes, I've been to tsunamis, uh, been now to tornadoes. And, and, you know, one thing I note is, especially with, this is really prevalent with floods, but uh, even if you don't get much, even if the walls stay up, but you lose your roof, uh, this is what you're left with. You're left with something like this, which is essentially, you know, but if you can keep the walls up, uh, then you in, in, incre vastly increase your probability of survival. 
This is, um, uh, coincidentally, this is actually, uh, I think, Sam, I think you showed this, uh, the, the neighborhood right by uh, Hobby Lobby, I believe. Uh, and this is that house that was, I think, two houses down from the house that you showed uh, that, that was built in 2010. And you can see this projectile. That, that actually goes into that building quite a bit. That's about a 10-foot piece there. So we had a number of detailed case studies, just to give you an example. Uh, and here you can see what we... What we have is, uh, um, you know, address, various information, uh, and we were able to pull a lot of that off of uh, Zillow and other other uh, web-based uh, uh, web-based pages or web pages, excuse me. Um, and then we had the the pictures before that you can see down below, uh, and then the post tornado, and and we go through and we we detail exactly, you know, what uh, what the forensics was if we could figure it out. At times, it wasn't always possible. You, you don't know what what happened first, but. With hurricanes, we can tell with straight wind, it's, it's much, much easier. So uh, Professor uh, Andy Grattinger and, and students, and I, I don't think they, they made it today, but uh, they've developed a, uh, based on our study, they're using the data from the study, developed this website, and I believe we have web access. It's just gonna take a second because it's probably wireless. Maybe more than one second. Do we, we do have web access? Oh, there we go. Okay. They probably knew I was waiting for it, so sometimes that slows it down. So Let's see. I'll, I'll give that a second. If it doesn't pull up, what I'll do is I'll let that... Uh, let, me, let me let that pull up in the background there, and I'll, I'll keep going for a second. So in, in, summary, um, in summary of at least the damage... You know, really, uh, what you've heard about so far today, at least in Tuscaloosa alone, thousands of homes destroyed uh, or severely damaged. Many that were severely damaged are, are effectively totaled. Oh, thank you. Let's see. I think it's just slow. It's just slow. Okay. Okay. We'll, uh, we'll come back to that. So the question, the question I'd ask you uh, as engineers, and I should add as architects, as, as planners, uh, you know, can we, can, but, but since I'm an engineer, uh, as an engineer, can we do better? Um, is there something we should be doing better? Because for years and years as structural engineers, we say we don't design for tornadoes. We design for hurricanes because we know exactly where those are going to hit. They're going to be on the coast, and we know the, the stretch that they'll hit. So that's you know, not easy, but, but relatively speaking, compared to tornadoes, fairly easy. But, you know, I'd offer to you, we don't, saying we don't design for tornadoes and saying that to many of the, the people that experience the tornado, um, I'd offer that as an excuse and not necessarily engineering. And so what if, what if we said, well, what if we consider a new philosophy, but stop and ask yourself, is it actually a new philosophy or am I just stating something that should be obvious. What if we said, well, let's look at dual objectives of design, call it a dual objective-based tornado engineering design philosophy. Two objectives, reduce monetary losses from damage as a res resulting from damage, and reduce the, the loss of human life. Well, we do that for earthquakes. We do that for pretty much everything. On a bridge, we don't expect a bridge to collapse. So, so aren't, aren't we really talking about just natural hazards engineering? And so, in a way, this is something that's obvious, but the probability of occurrence is so low that we've come to play roulette in a way. So for the dual objectives of design, for a light frame wood building, I'll focus just on, on residential buildings for now or light commercial, and this is my, that, because that is my expertise. If we look at, uh, say, an EF0, EF1 wind speeds, what we're really looking at is we're looking at a, a component philosophy. In other words, how do I keep the, the, the exterior, the pieces, the cladding, how do I keep those on the building? Uh, and so to do that, and that's a function of damage. You know, no, typically, if shingles are lost, uh, it's not a life safety issue. So that'd be EF0, EF1. For EF2, 
I begin to get, it's a damage issue, but I begin to get some life safety uh, in, into the mix and some life safety issues, and that becomes not just component, but that also becomes system level. In other words, my main force resisting system, my main wind force resisting system, you know, because you can blow down, you know, in theory, you could blow down a building at 135, or you saw, I think, the, the building uh, in the IBHS uh, test lab come off at 96. If you're in that building, you know, that's a life safety issue. Then at EF3, we begin to get into, yes, there's some damage issues, but it, it really becomes more of a life safety uh, and so that becomes then a system level philosophy. And so that's the, 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 the two, two philosophies really. And then as we get into EF4, that becomes purely life safety, just like here in Tuscaloosa for the, the portions of the tornado that were EF4. Uh, and that becomes system, but then also an alternative. And that alternative, of course, we know is uh, storm shelters, getting underground, getting in a safe room, taking shelter. Uh, and then EF5, uh, unfortunately, all bets are off for a wood structure, as we know, uh, and, and that becomes life safety and um, get into not a safe place, but, you know, or excuse me, not, not your safe place, but get into a shelter or a, uh, something that's, that's certified. So to give you just an idea from a structural engineering point of view, um, you know, what could we do? And, and I think, uh, I think uh, Sam actually gave some fantastic examples uh, of, uh, uh, with uh, illustrations and things. But just to give you an idea, I won't go through all of these, I'll just show one or two. Uh, but one, you know, one of the big ones, and I'm gonna show some, some, some plots of how that works, uh, one of the big things, like for roof sheathing, you know, we, we typically don't connect the, you know, we're only able to, if the, uh, um, uh, excuse me, if the uh, joists or the uh, trusses are spaced at, say, 24 inches, well, then we, we don't necessarily get to, then that means the edge nails on the short side are typically at 24 inches. Well, if we can, you know, it's, it, it means changing the culture of wood frame construction in a way, but if we can get some kind of blocking in there and things like that, because what happens is the, the sheathing actually lifts up, it deforms, and then it actually peels the nail off. They don't always come out and straight up lift like people think. And we've, we've done testing, we've written papers on that. And so they're weaker than we even think if you let it deform. And so there's lots and lots of details. And those things, we, we have solutions to them. And it just means, it just means training and, and training somebody to build it this way and, and figuring out a way to do it. And it does mean cost. And that, that's the big issue, I think. Um, but the big thing that we've noticed is, and I think this was, was, has been said throughout today, is the lack of continuous load path from the foundation to the roof. Uh, the roof wants to come off uh, just to be sucked right off. Uh, and if we can get those loads into the foundation without any weak link, because like we know, obviously, a, a, chain is, is, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link, and that goes for the load path as well. Now this uh, should sum that up. I'm just just joking, but um, <laughs> um, so do not pay attention to the equation. Uh, just uh, but the uh, the wording on this. So, okay, so what we've got is we've got this, any any component in this house has some probability of fail failing, given that there's some tornado. That intensity is an EF2 or an EF3 or an EF4, whatever the wind speed. And then I can say, well, what's the probability of that? And that's, that's the hard part. That one, that one I'm going to look to John to, to give me that number at some point. So, and um, we, can, we can get this part. It's this part that's difficult. And it's that part that remains the, the challenge. That, that's the reason people don't accept a design for a tornado. And, and maybe rightly so. That's not for me to decide as an individual. That's for uh, groups like the 100 of us here today to decide and ICC. And so uh, together, what I get is I get this conditional probability times, and that, that deconditions it, essentially. And then I get the probability of failure for some component in, in a building, whatever that is, whether it's a piece of roof sheathing. Uh, it can be the main force resisting system. It can be anything. So then I say, OK, well, uh, you know, what's the, the chance of that? And so I use what's called a, a function, a limit state function to do that. And that's simply my resistance, so that's strength. That's the, the wind force, and that's the dead load. That's basically, obviously, the wind's lifting it up. This is pushing it down, gravity. Now, this to, to the engineers out there, this will look familiar. What this is is this is, uh, at least the, the table on the bottom right will look familiar um, from ASC 7. Some of these, I don't know if all of them will, but 
Uh, and so what I have is I have these statistics, and these statistics have, have been developed uh, over time, over the last 15 years, uh, and this is dead load, this is exposure for wind, this is all these things. Um, but the one thing that hasn't been done before, that, you're, that actually I'm presenting it here for the first time, and this is, this is right here, and I have a, a postdoc a colleague and postdoc of mine in the back that, that did this work, and what you can see here is that some tests were done in a tornado simulator at uh, Iowa State University. It's a large 17-foot round simulator, multi-million dollar simulator, and, and then the model goes in, and it's about the size of a laptop, and that's a building model with all, all sorts of pressure sensors in it. And what it does is it basically generates this, this vortex, and you can measure wind pressures. And what they showed is that for components and cladding, you have an amplification due to the vertical, the strong vertical component uh, in a vortex versus a straight line wind of about 1.4 to 2.4. And for the main lateral force resisting system, it's about 1.8 to 3.2. So you can see you might actually, in a tornado, you might actually ha you have significantly higher wind speeds. So if you design for 130 miles an hour in a hurricane, the tornado is going to cause a much, much more significant force. Now, we don't know exactly how much. And so what we said is we said, well, it's a, it's a statistical procedure anyway, so let's Let's take these and we'll just say, okay, there's an equal probability of being anywhere between 1.8 and 3.2. And we just bring it into the mix that way. So if we did that, we did that for a very simple building, and you wouldn't want to live in here, there's no bathroom, but it's a, a very simple building, just two bedrooms. And the idea was just to get enough walls in there. Uh, and I'm, I'm actually going to jump to the next example because I think that illustrates it a little better. But so what you can see is this is. Uh, this is uh, three 8D toenails. This is one H2.5 clip. Uh, that is a Simpson product, I believe. And then, uh, uh, and then two H2.5 clips. Now, I, I, don't, I don't know that the uh, uh, wood member can actually take the two clips, and so we're assuming the wood can generate, that, that can, can handle this. Uh, so that's one of the assumptions. But what you can see is that in a, in a hurricane, you can take quite a, quite a bit of load, and you can see that in a hurricane, your probability is about two, three percent of failure at about 140 miles an hour, which with one clip, which is about what you'd expect because that's how it's advertised is that this is going to keep keep it on in 130 miles per hour, uh, and it will. Now we get over to a tornado, and you can see things begin to shift because now, to get to get the same, I need close to two H2.5 clips just by bringing in that factor from Iowa State's research. And so, so what you can see is that those those loads they're higher, but they're still manageable because this this speed of 130 is an EF2 tornado. And so, going back to what Sam and others have said, if 85 or 80 some percent or 90 percent, whatever it is of even an EF4 or an EF5 tornado is EF2 and below, then can I, why, not save, why not save 85 to 90 percent of the buildings? And not only that, but make sure you're protecting life safety in those buildings. So one thing, uh, one thing we've, we've thought about uh, is really you know, what is acceptable for the stakeholders. And so, as you've heard today, this was, this was one of the worst tornado outbreaks in the U.S. history. I believe I heard uh, top five, something like that. Um, there, there's momentum in the wind hazard community to move tornado resistant construction forward. There's, there's been talk, I'm, I'm actually on a uh, ASC 7, which is how we determine the minimum building loads for uh, buildings and other structures. I'm on a tsunami subcommittee, and there's a chapter going in on tsunamis, and there's actually been talk of a chapter going in on tornadoes. Uh, how mandated this would be, I, I don't know, um, but there, there, is, there is talk of that at least about two, three months ago, right after, I think it was about a month after Joplin, so, so uh, six weeks after Tuscaloosa. Um, and so that, so that may happen. If that happens, it would be, whether it'd be ready for the, the, 20, the 2015, I don't know, but, but I would think so. And so the next steps and challenges, and these are really the, the big challenges that I see, and that's identify that realistic threshold wind speed. In other words, you know, what failure probability is acceptable to the stakeholders? What's acceptable to, to all of you out there? Is, uh, you know, I mean, are we losing lives? Uh, 
no damage. You know, it's a huge range, and so what are we looking to do? And my gut feel is similar to, to what you've heard today, is that, that it's, it's really somewhere around 130 miles per hour, but with the tornado forces, not necessarily with hurricane forces, and so it'd be like 150, 160 mile an hour hurricane. You know, we may be able to do that. And then the spatial characteristics of the tornado loading, um, you know, we, we know they're different than straight line winds, but how are they different? And then the key is develop implementable approaches uh, because not everybody's gonna run computational fluid dynamics and tornado simulations and things like that. What they want is, is prescriptive design and, and uh, uh, charts and tables and things. So figure out how we can get it implemented if that's, if that's the path that, that the public and the stakeholders and the government and the communities wanna take. And so as I mentioned, this was, um, this was a uh, National Science Foundation funded uh, project uh, over the course of about a week immediately and then of course quite a bit to do this. And I, I put this up here because I, I thought this was just, um, you know, said a lot. The uh, house was gone, but the large $500 barbecue is chained to the truck. I don't know if you can see that. Um, and, then, uh, and then also the other thing I wanted to mention is one of our colleagues, Dave Pravat, uh, was walking around in his Florida gear. So, uh, but anyway, he owes me two steak dinners after the last two years because we bet each year. So, so with that, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>